Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another live stream from Shobi. My name is Abdul Chohan. I'm the Vice President of Learning at Shobi. And um, of course, those of you that might not know what Shobi is, it's an assessment and learning platform um, used by educators all over the world. However, um, today's session, I am super excited and absolutely delighted um, that I have someone that actually, um, when I first started teacher training, we I was reading um, books by him, um, followed thoughts uh, and ideas from him as well, um, and certainly in the school um, that I co-founded, um, you know, Andy's books have kind of been um, on the shelf there as well. So I am super pleased to kind of um, have um, Professor Andy Hargreaves um, with us today. Um, for those most educators will obviously know about um, Andy, but those of you that don't, he's Emeritus Professor at Boston College. He is also um, at uh, the University of Ottawa as well. Also um, Director of um, Change, Engagement and Innovation. Is that right? Education, uh, correct. Yeah, and uh, president of Arc Education, and most importantly of all, although he is um, in a very cold place called um, uh, Ontario and in Canada, um, he's actually a Lancashire lad. Um, mm -hmm. So that is that is a, a big one. And I, actually, for me, I met you uh, for the first time in Banff. Uh, at the principals conference um, when you were presenting and I uh, had the privilege of presenting there as well many years ago so I thought it would be wonderful uh, to have you on so welcome welcome uh, and thank you for agreeing to our live stream Andy. I remember all that Abdul and it's a pleasure to be chatting with you today. So um, Andy um, kind of let's kind of start off right your journey into education I know that you're here from Accrington um, you were a head teacher there as well. What, what was your what was your kind of initial foray into education? Tell us like the the first few years of kind of how did you get in? Was it something that you always wanted to do? Well, the the short version of this is uh, growing up in a working class community in in Accrington. I had a, a, a terrific primary education, uh, particularly with my best teacher, a woman called Mary Hindle. And uh, a wonderful thing I got a chance to do uh, later in uh, life when she was in her 80s, I was in my 50s, was they asked me to come back and lay the foundation stone for the new building of my old school. So wow. I said I'd, I'd do it if I could do it with my best teacher, Mary Hindle, who was in about 86 and still as sharp as a razor, basically. So if you're going to the school now, you can see both our names there. And she did lots of things we talk about today, uh, whole child, uh, focus on uh, creativity and uh, writing, playing outside, not just, not just inside, kids working in groups, uh, project-based learning, uh, all that. Was very inspiring. I, I sort of wanted to be like her, basically. And then, then I went to secondary school, which was the evil twin of everything <laughs> I'd ever experienced in, in primary school. It was a boys' secondary school in the 1950s, not, not particularly good with the emotional side of life. I lost my dad when I was 12 years old. I had two brothers who went to work in factories. My mum got, got very, very sick. Uh, and unlike a lot of kids, around about age 13, 14, I found that, that you know I was really in charge of my mum rather than my mum being in charge of me, and it, it created some problems at school. And I, I never got to any mass classes because I was uh, vacuuming up, buying, buying things for dinner, cleaning the house, uh, trying to get my mum out of bed, things like that. And, and the school was pretty unresponsive to that. So uh, I think like a lot of people, I, I went into teaching as a working class kid because actually it was one of only two middle class jobs I knew. The other one was social work because I had to go with my mum to collect social security and, uh, and, and do the interviews there. And the other one was teaching, but, but I went into teaching because I wanted to, I actually from the very beginning wanted to go into teacher training and, and bring, out, bring out the best in teachers of the best teacher I'd had and avoid the worst of, of the worst teachers I'd, I'd had at the same time. So that, that's how I kind of got started. I taught in primary school, then uh, I went off and did, um, did a PhD in, uh, in Leeds. I did the first study of English middle schools uh, ever. They don't exist now, looks like no. I have to kill them off. Uh, <laughs> but uh, not far from Bradford, uh, actually, was, was where I did the work. 
And then, uh, you know, I worked in um, various places in England. I'd, I'd say one of the key ones was in uh, the Open University. We had no students except, uh, except at a distance. So I learned how to engage students who you couldn't see, which has been very helpful during, during the pandemic. Um, and at Oxford, uh, we worked, our department worked a lot with Tim Brighouse in his early years. So Tim Brighouse, oh, yeah. uh, who's, uh, you know, an icon really across uh, the country, seconded huge numbers of teachers to come and work with us at the university. And that's, that's when I really learned to work with teachers and with leaders, not just kind of do research on them and then complain about what they were doing, but, but, but actu actually do things, build things, study things, inquire to things improve things uh, together. Uh, then in 1987, uh, in the middle of Thatcherism, when uh, jobs like mine, jobs like anyone actually were, were very hard to do, I already had two brothers in Canada. So both my brothers, they'd emigrated. And so we moved to Canada to the Ontario Institute of Education uh, in Toronto. Uh, there I met Michael Fullan. Uh, I got involved uh, even before I started working with Michael in looking at uh, teacher collaboration and the power of collaborative cultures. And that, that's driven a lot of my work ever since, I would say. And I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, um, a lot of teachers um, that are teaching today will have probably grown up on a variety of different kind of um, pedagogical diets, if you want. Um, and certainly, you know, yourself, John Hattie, Michael Fuller, and the people that have kind of featured in their um, journey to understanding good pedagogy, what works, you know, impact and, and, and so on. Um, what, what would you say, uh, Andy, is kind of like, um, I suppose, that the key things for a good education system yeah and i know that's kind of like massive right but um you know um like i'm, I'm kind of looking at not just necessarily um um countries like the uk and the us and canada but generally yeah. speaking if we're looking at a good learning experience um what what does that dna what does that kind of look like yeah, that, that, that's a great uh, question, Abdul, and that, that is the million-dollar question for, for everybody. And there's a few cliches uh, to answer it, but, but I think the first clear way to start with is what it's not, you know, and it, it should not be just about basic literacy and maths and preparing for the tests and the SATs that we've got, that we've got in England in, in particular, and then on to exams and the GCSEs and finding out how many grades A to C you've got and, and, and having that whole thing drive the system with a top-down bureaucracy. But rather, f first of all, I think, is um, when I was in primary school, they, they did um, I have access to old inspection reports uh, yeah. for, for, the, for the time I was in the school. And, and the inspection reports talk about things like the quality of the children's writing, um, the, the beauty of the nature table, the, the experience that the that, that kids were having in school. And at that time, in 1967, not long after, there was a report, which is famous, called the Plowden Report, which is about children in primary schools. And, and one of the things it said was, it had a great paragraph saying, in the future, our kids will need to be, they'll need to be diverse and tolerant, they'll need to be good citizens, they'll need to be... Uh, changed jobs many times in their lifetime. They were saying this in 1967. And, uh, but it said, but the main thing is, is to treat children as children now and, and actually educate them as children to feel happy, not happy all the time, but, but for challenged, uh, fulfilled, uh, learn, learn something new, have good relationships with, with the peers, uh, with, with their teacher, of, uh, feel part of something bigger than themselves, however you can define that. And, and, and if you treat the child well as a child, that is the best way, they said, to create citizens for uh, the future. And so I, I think sometimes we see, you know, here's, here's a new book on well-being in schools uh, that my colleague Dennis Shirley and I have written. And sometimes we think, yeah, well-being is important, but really it's just there to back up the academic learning. Um, and they're not. They're both, they're both important in, in their own right. Once you've got that as your goal, and many countries do. In, in Colombia, the goals are a peace and democracy. 
That, that, that those are like not peripheral goals. Those are those are prime goals. If if you go to Norway after the uh, murders and tragedies of Anders uh, Breivik, who yeah. murdered scores of uh, young people, uh, yeah. but peace is peace is one of their. Uh, you, you know, I've gone into Norwegian schools, and the first thing you see is the children singing outside about songs of songs of peace and belonging. They also have high standards. They also have have high achievement. These things are not competitive. Then what do you need in a system to enable that to happen? You need teachers who are passionate about what they do, who come in for it for the right for the right reasons, who are well trained, who yeah. have like a university training and a practical training that Absolutely. brings it together, who know how to work work together, who can uh, want to respond to the diversity of their kids. And in the old days when I was at school and all the kids were white like me and in my school, that was cognitive diversity, which is still very important now. Uh, now it's other kinds. It's uh, racial, it's religious, it's a uh, gender identity. It's um, in my country here, uh, it's indigenous identity and so on. So uh, you, you have to know how to, th there's no magic formula. You can't learn in advance about every single culture there is. You just have to respond to the child uh, in in front of you, le learn what you can, learn learn with them, and and tailor the learning so that it engages them. And then work with your colleagues, r read a bit, look at the evidence. You don't have to master all of it, but kind of chuck that evidence in for all of you to to deal with. And um, and and uh, have a you know if you're going to have an inspection system, it should check up on you a bit, but not too much. Is um, so just check up on him a bit, make sure nothing goes, you know, totally yeah. awry. Um, but but mainly just if you've got the right people and they can work together, let them get on with it. Absolutely. And I, I definitely kind of hear that, certainly from the time when I was at school. And I think, I think schools nowadays, especially with the type of diversity that you've uh, talked about, they are fantastic places for planned coincidences you know meeting people yeah. meeting different cultures quite i would probably say that you know children uh, have the opportunity to find out more about each other's cultures in 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 schools and and the kind of friendships and relationships that they have today that they would have done um certainly in the past and and for me that's from a shobi perspective that's been quite interesting because we've introduced like this audio feedback and video chat and so on and uh, you know, that's something that we and we have this kind of like class discussion element and the ability oh. to continue conversations beyond the classroom and so on, which is kind of hugely powerful. And I suppose we see that through a lot of social media um, uh, continuing, you know, kind of beyond school hours and, and, and so on as well. Um, so and in terms of like, um, you know, what what is it what what is it that we kind of. Um, are getting wrong in many ways, yeah, in education, right? Um, we've we've kind of got um, quite in me in 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 a, I suppose, um, quite advanced systems in some ways. I know certainly in the UK, there's we have a, a lot of focus on evidence based approaches mm -hmm. to teaching, whether that's direct instruction, whether that's kind of looking at things like Rosenstein's principles and so on, and you know, uh, cognitive kind of development, memory learning, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of great things that are happening in education, and people are kind of getting um, uh, aware of that and you know, trying to put that in practice and look at research and so on. Um, but, but for me, quite often, it's all, it's important also to look at those things that, that shouldn't be happening or what things should we be removing rather than just continuing to, to add things to the system. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is a conversation teachers love to have, um, <laughs> but, but providing they don't then have to go and do it, but which is, you know, all the things that are wrong and all the things we need to get rid of or, or do less of. Uh, I, I, I think at the top of the tree are a couple of things. One is clearly governments who don't care a lot about education or, or really yeah. don't care a lot or understand what education looks like for everybody, not just what education looks like if you used to go to Eton, uh, for yeah. example, which, which most of the governments in the UK, uh, the, the, the cabinet actually did. Um, so, so we've seen during COVID, for example, if you 
compare Scotland that I do a lot of work with. Uh, so I'm one of 10 advisors for Nicola Sturgeon on education in uh, Scotland. Uh, during the pandemic, they had a COVID education um, recovery group uh, yeah. that you know, I've spoken to and, and, and some of the rest have too, uh, that, that's met every week um, online and consists of you know, the teacher unions, uh, a parents' organization, students, um, um, ministers, uh, deputy ministers, um, uh, health professionals, uh, health experts, epidemiologists, uh, all working together every week trying to figure out, all genuinely caring about the kids and genuinely caring about families and communities and, and figuring out the best thing together, then deciding something and say, okay, we're all behind this. And if it works well, you, you all take the credit. And, and if it goes badly, you all take the blame. And you said, sorry, we didn't get this right. Um, we'll, we'll learn from that and we'll move on. And I think we find in the places that have done as well, where I'd include Ontario actually r right now, uh, the government hasn't done that. So during COVID, it's just an exaggeration of the rest of educational life, which is things, things come from a distant height. You've, uh, they come at random. You've, you have no idea where they come from, what, what they're for, or um, what, what you're supposed to do about it, or if it's actually even at all meant, meant to benefit your kids. So, so the countries that are best, education's not political. I have, uh, I have seven uh, countries in a group called the ARC Education Collaboratory. We've met every six weeks during the pandemic, uh, ministers, teacher union leaders, and so on. We have uh, conservative governments, socialist governments, liberal governments, nationalist governments. We even had a pirate party at one time, coalition governments. Um, and the thing that they have in common is that they actually, um, you know, and it's true, conservative governments do care about education for everybody in some places and, and want to make it better. Uh, the, the, the point is, is whatever your politics, um, that you really care about the kids. I've worked with Trump supporters. I've worked with teachers who were Trump supporters. A lot of teachers voted for Trump in, in the United States for all kinds of reasons. I have to put aside whether they're Trump supporters or not when I work with them. The point is, is do they really care about the kids, all the kids? Do they want to get them engaged? Do they, do they want them to do better? So as, as far as you can, you, you need to be in a country or a system where, where it, it really is about the kids and everybody's working together to, to make that happen. And, exactly. and, and then you know, there's, there's like three other distractions to, to get out the way, I think. Uh, one, is, um, one is too much high stakes testing and uh, this is your business, this is what you're in. And uh, I think we're at a fantastic moment now coming hopefully towards the end of COVID where kids have uh, not been taking exams for two years, kids have been going to university and might never have gone there before. Let's see how they do. Let's, let's monitor. We know exams are a terrible predictor of, uh, of, of university performance. We've always felt we couldn't change them. Well, for two years, we've, we've managed perfectly well without them. So, so let's take this huge opportunity with a digital because Digital can give you algorithmic feedback on the simple stuff, uh, yeah. not on the writing. You know, I don't, I don't want to pour my heart out for an algorithm, but, yeah. but it, but it, but it will, it will give you feedback on on the simple stuff and save teachers a lot of time. Um, you can take photographs, images, uh, samples yeah. of work. You can share it, yeah. share it with the kids, share it with parents, share it with each other. Uh, much easier to develop moderated assessments. You can do that across schools. You don't all have to show up in the same school in order to do that. And 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 COVID's increased collaboration wherever you are, anywhere in the world. So, so I think we have a fantastic opportunity. And and uh, I'm involved in an OECD review starting uh, tomorrow of a country I can't name, uh, which really, uh, but not very far away, which really dramatically wants to change its. Uh, it's assessment system. So I, I think this is like a massive chance now to change something we, we felt we could, uh, you know, this is like 1983 or whatever it was when nobody yeah. thought we could do away with physical punishment because what would we do to get the kids to behave, you know, unless we gave them a clip across the <laughs> ear. And then along came the yeah. European Union and uh, we got rid of it and, you know, chaos and mayhem did not ensue. And I, I think yeah. we're, at that, we're at that kind of moment now.
Uh, uh, we, we certainly had that. We certainly had that experience um, working with schools in Glasgow. So the whole of Glasgow kind of uses Shobi. This was before wow. the pandemic, wow. and um, one of the schools that I was working with personally, um, you know, we kind of uh, launched a digital assessment system through Shobi. There's a digital feedback and so on. Like you said, photos, video, audio, everything can be uploaded and so on. And what was fascinating was when I met the head teacher again two years later. Um, and incidentally, I met Maureen McKenna there as well at the same time. I, yeah, Maureen, so many, oh, I know. Um, the, you know, the head teacher was saying, actually, we've performed, we've performed even better. Yeah. You know, where schools were struggling, actually, yeah. kids performed better, and yeah. and that was kind of like a, a quite an eye opener. But Andy, I still want to hear about the other two. So you've talked well, about. The other two. Here's one where you can help me, because because I'd uh, I'd really like you to take the lead on this if you if you agree with me, and and that is technology. So um, you know, here, here we are with technology. I've got three grandkids upstairs all working on. All working on the main floor on uh, on virtual school right right now. They're, they're going back on uh, Monday. Um, I've I've seen in my own work some very powerful uses of uh, technology, including with assessment, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but but we 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 need to do two things. I think you know pedagogically anything we use, we we need to use it where it where it's the best thing to use and where it'll make a difference. And the yeah. same applies to technology. So Absolutely. just because you've got Chromebooks there, don't throw them in your school and use them all the time for everything just because just because they're there. Yeah. Use them like, yeah. you know, crayons, glue, footballs, yeah. just, you know, when you need Absolutely. them, use them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that's the thing. And uh, uh, but, but be open to it. And I think, again, a great moment. I think you'd find it pretty hard anywhere in the global north now to find a teacher who doesn't have some competence with technology as a as, as a tool for learning so True. monumental opportunity uh, but at the same time every school we say in our book uh, so we have another book which i'll just show you <laughs> um and in, in our other book that came out this year five past the student engagement uh, something that our center has developed in canada yeah is a charter for ethical uh, technology. And uh, in that charter for ethical technology, um, I, uh, you've frozen, you've just frozen out, you come back on now. In our charter for ethical uh, technology, uh, one of our 10 points is uh, every school, every system, which might be an academy trust chain, might be a local authority, uh, every government, uh, every teacher's union, should have um, a way, uh, should have a group that looks at all the opportunities of technology and identifies and manages all the risks, which are considerable. Excess yeah. screen time, um, yeah. adolescent girls' anxiety because of 30% of British girls, adolescent girls are constantly modifying images of themselves online, which makes them ashamed of actually how, how, they, how they actually or on, on, online bullying, um, digital addiction, uh, algorithms that reinforce your prejudices. Every single school should should have this to look at the problems and the risks as well as the opportunities. So I, I think that's the second kind of big risk area. And, and one of those is just to free up other things like learning more outdoors, for example, being in nature. Um, yeah which is the best way to connect you with not just like doing a project when you're 15 on climate change all of a sudden yeah. but but being out in nature from when you're five really yeah. really connects just like our indigenous uh communities do is seeing yeah. us and nature as being part of the same thing not Absolutely. not totally separate from each other and, and then the third one which is a hard one and i'll we don't talk about this in the books but I'll throw it out there is um, is parents, and um, you know, but no politicians gonna gonna ever uh, run a platform saying parents need to get their act together. Um, but but a lot of parents do. You know, you yeah. you walk around, and you've got uh, parents or uh, 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 childcare minders. You go into coffee shop, walk down the street, sit on a bench at the at the play park. 
uh, the, the, the the kids are playing or they're in the pram, what the parents doing, they're scrolling on the they're scrolling on the screen, looking at the messages. So so let, let's have a movement to get parents back, but even before reading or hearing kids yeah. read, just like yeah. talking to the kids, you know, and listening to them, taking them seriously, getting them yeah. uh, getting them motivated. And I, th I think that's a place where, you know, in a nice way, schools yeah. can schools can yeah. really take the lead with the parents. Absolutely. I, and, you know, actually, um, when we kind of did this one-to-one -one program with um, technology many years ago, um, back at the school in Bolton, um, it was quite fascinating, really. Um, social media probably wasn't out in this at the same level and the same strength as it is now. So there wasn't yeah. things like Instagram and then so on. Um, and you still saw students communicating and they would use the technology if they would use the technology if it made life easier to do something, right? Yeah. If I had to look up a word and find out its meaning, I could just do that on a device really quickly rather than getting a dictionary out and flicking through the pages and so on. Mm -hmm. We had quite a diverse population and we would definitely see kind of like students that would type, change the keyboard on their device into their local language yeah. Type in the word in their local language, which might be Persian or whatever it was at the time. And then when they hit images, um, it would kind of show images of the object of the word that they typed in. Yeah. And then they would yeah. use that to show the teacher that this is what I mean kind of thing and use that as a dictionary thing. So we kind of saw that happening across classrooms. We start, saw that happening across the school and so on. But as as kind of you know, social social apps developed and, and so on, um, that kind of digital intelligence um, needed to be a subject or it needed to be addressed um, in schools to kind of understand what's acceptable and what isn't. And actually, you know, the kind of damage that it might cause you as well. Um, so completely agree with you on that. I'd be happy to kind of get involved in anything like that because as much as schools and educators are recognizing that there are efficiencies that technology brings um of course you know it's not something that you can just switch off and say hey you're never going to use a technology piece of technology ever again um yeah. but you know actually educating and um developing that kind of um i suppose you know, resilience and kind of aptitude towards how to use it effectively becomes key. I also completely agree with you on the parental aspect as well. Um, yes. Schools talk about parental engagement quite a lot, but actually um, it's it's kind of interesting, right? Because there isn't, quite in a lot of countries, there isn't anywhere where parents can go where they will get told about that behavior. So of course. I see um, that behavior. I see that behavior kind of transcend through classes as well. doesn't matter, you know, socioeconomically, if you come from uh, a well-off background, so on, you're seeing that behavior actually across the board, you know? And, and, and you know, so it's just like kids, which is, you know, there's a little bit where you kind of wag the finger and you say, you know, look, look, just kind of get off there a while and, you know, talk, talk to your kid and so on. But mainly if, if, if it's one or two parents not doing what they should be doing, problem with the parents... It's just like a school. If it, if there's a lot of parents doing this, there's there's something going wrong in our communities and our societies. And I think that that's how schools can address it, which is from the point of view of understanding, saying, you know, this is hard. You got stuff, you got stuff coming at you all the time. You, you might have your employer like coming at you from from all uh, all times of the of the day. Uh, it's very hard to be off your devices. Some of you are working three jobs. And uh, it, it's hard for you to find time for your kids. So uh, I think we need to know that the problem is there, but but not have a bit of a wag of the finger occasionally, but 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 mainly not demonise it. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, um, it, I knew this would happen. It's like kind of thirty minutes just literally flies by. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of looking at my clock and I was thinking we're only kind of 10 minutes in and it's um, 30 minutes already kind of thing. But, um, you know, I really appreciate you coming on, kind of sharing your thoughts and so on. Um, I know that, you know, there's a bunch of there's what, is, what books, the number of books that you've written at the moment, we're up to about 25, 26, something like that, I think. Um you know, um, but your latest one on the well-being element, um, certainly that's something that I will be interested in 
um, with respect to the the ongoing work that I'm doing as well. And I'd love to kind of, I suppose, in the future at some point, um, have you on again and tell us about, you know, the projects that you're doing and, and so on as well. But I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts and opinions with us today. Thanks for this, Abdul, and uh, thanks for your leadership in education. It's a fantastic thing. Thank you very much. Thank you.